Okay, so today is the last of the series on Naturally Supernatural, the last of the gifts of inspiration, and I'm going to talk not for a long time this morning, but on the gift of the interpretation of tongues. Actually, it goes hand in hand with last week. We could probably have amalgamated it into one session, but I really felt the need to, to um, highlight the need for tongues last week. Now, the use of tongues is, is absolutely vital for every Christian. And if you weren't here last week, then go online and, and listen to the message or ask for a copy and catch up to date with where we're at. These gifts are for every Christian and for the edifying of the church and for the edifying of you. That means building you up, strengthening you and encouraging you. So this is the last gift In the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the interpretation of tongues. What does that actually mean? I'm going to go through this rather quickly, um, but I I believe that it's really important for us to understand. It, It speaks for itself. When somebody speaks in tongues, you don't know what they're saying. The gift of the interpretation of tongues explains that what has been said. That's basically what it means. In fact... The Greek word hermeneia literally means to explain the meaning of words in a different language. So, you know, God wants to communicate to us in a whole number of ways. The very best way that God speaks to us is when we're by ourselves reading the word of God and God speaks his word to us, you can prove God for yourself. For me, that is the number one way. There's something so special and sweet about walking with the Holy Spirit and having the voice of the Holy Spirit minister to you. you. Nobody can take that away from you. It's living. It's with you. It's powerful. That rhema word, the spoken living word, comes alive in you. And all kinds of things begin to happen. Yvonne had a, a word uh, a couple of days ago. Um, the builder and I went to see Kingdom Bank, our mortgage uh, bank. And we've got an advance agreed on, a, on our mortgage um, and uh, with some conditions to it. And so we went to talk to them about the conditions and, and one thing and another. And just so that Paul, the builder, had some confidence that this money will be released when it is released and all that kind of a thing. And, um, and one, of the, one of the big hiccups all along has been the fact that we wanted to appoint um, the heating and ventilation system in the building, which is going to cost 100000 or near, near, near enough. We're still in negotiation to try and get it down but £100,000. That is going to be an efficient system that we can extend for the next phase as well. And, um, and the, thing, the thing is this, you know, when, because it's an outside company, when you place an order, you have to pay the bill. So Paul is a real righteous man and, and a man of integrity, and he says, I don't want to place the order until we know we can pay for it, which is absolutely the right thing, you know, about counting the cost. This is where faith and presumption come together very closely, actually. So we were working all of this through, talking about it, and Yvonne said, I've got a word, and, and from, I forget where it was from now, Chronicles, two Chronicles, about Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was. But the whole context was, go forward, go forward. So um, I used that word, I said, Paul, I, I, let's, let's just go forward. Let's just, he says, you know what, Phil, let's do that. So we were with the bank manager, and uh, in Nottingham, and we were sitting down, and, uh, and Paul, Paul, he said, do you know what? I'm going to place the order. We're going to do it. We're going to go forward. We're going to believe God. <laughs> this is the builder, talking faith, you know. But he did that based on a word. It based on a rhema word. The best way God can speak to you is by yourself. But there are other ways that God speaks. And God can challenge you in, through the, a prophecy or tongues and the interpretation of tongues is another way. It's not the only way. Actually, I believe that when prophecy is given, generally speaking, it's not direction. It's for confirmation. And it's for edification and to confirm what God has already said to you. The best way is for you to find God for yourself. You don't need to go to a prophet to hear God. God wants to speak to you. Right? <coughs> so, there are other ways in which God w- <coughs> will speak, and this is one of them. Now, the gift of the interpretation of tongues 
needs the other, need, is a lesser gift in the sense that it needs the others to work. It needs the gift of tongues to work for this to, to, to come into operation. It actually takes more faith to operate prophecy, and it takes more faith to operate the interpretation of tongues than it does to give a message in tongues. It doesn't matter which way around it is. They all need faith to operate, and we need, we need to be men and women of faith anyway, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's get into this then. Misinterpretations. <coughs> Can you pass me that water, love? Uh, the other one, that's it. Thanks. <clears throat> the gift of interpretation is not a translation. It is interpretation. Now, the gift of interpretation is not the gift of translation in the sense that you are literally translating word for word what has been spoken in tongues. When you translate, you are conveying word for word the meaning of one language to another. And an interpretation is the basic meaning of something. Actually, it's interesting, you know, when a prophecy comes, God could be speaking, a number of people have come to me and said, I had that, you know. I had that in the meeting. Let's say I get up and prophesy or somebody prophesies and I've had a number of people say, I had that very thing. It came to me earlier, right? Actually, what that does is it shows that you're hearing God. If you'd have got up first, you'd have given it first, actually. But there you go. Um, but I guarantee this, if you'd have prophesied, it would not have been exactly the same as the other person that did it. There's a different take on it. And so interpretation is that vain. It's, that, it's the way that it communicates. Interestingly, I'm really pleased about this because every gift is different. You are a different gift to the person sitting next to you. And the way God wants to speak to you and through you is different to the way the person wants to speak to and through the person sitting next to you. So interpretation is to give the basic understanding and the basic meaning. So it may not be absolutely word for word a translation. Um, now, actually, the real Greek context of this is to explain thoroughly the meaning of words in different tongues. Having said that, God is sovereign and works in wonderful ways, doesn't he? And it could end up being a translation without you even knowing it. Actually, when you translate, you know if I was to start speaking in French and we had a translator here, um, then that, that would be word for word, a translation of what was being said. I remember being in a meeting a few years ago and a message in tongues was given in this meeting and I gave the interpretation. And uh, a lady came to me afterwards. She was uh, the manager of British Airways at Birmingham Airport. And... Um, she just got saved. That was another story. We ended up with all kinds of things going off there, actually. Um, as a result of this girl, uh, what was the, what's the name of that? Um, you know, the, in, the, content, the inter, international police. What, what? Interpol. Interpol. Aye, aye, that's right. Well, this, guy, this lady's boyfriend uh, was a Muslim. And uh, we went to visit her one day. And when he got to hear that she'd, she'd given her life to Jesus... And, um, and we went to visit her, and he'd beat her up. And she had black eye, blood everywhere. Now, we're talking about the manager of British Airways at Birmingham Airport. Mm -hmm. And when we locked on the door, never been to her place before, she was so worried. She said, go away, quick. You must go away. He might come back. So I said, it doesn't matter. We're here to we'll pray for you. So we did. She said, you've got to go. You must go. He's a bad man. He's not good, and all this. And uh, anyway... What I didn't realize was uh, she had stood up against him. This guy was a smuggler, smuggling um, paintings into the country, using, using her, and she wanted to stop doing all of that and went to the police and so on. Well, the police contacted me to say, in Leamington, to say, uh, we, we need you to come in and, and speak to us. I went in, they said, well, there's a contract out on your head, Interpol, are checking all of this. So, you, so it was kind of interesting. Now, this girl was a very intelligent girl. And uh, uh, she, she knew different languages. 
she spoke French, and, and also she spoke one of the African languages. Well, coming back to this meeting, she'd not long been saved, and then this message in tongues was given. I interpreted it. She came to me after the meeting, and she said, I didn't know you spoke Swahili. I said, well, I don't. She said, yes, you do. I said, no, I don't. She says, well, what you said, you translated what that other lady said. She had no clue what it was about. She said, I speak Swahili. You translated it. So I explained I gave an interpretation. She says, no, 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 no. You translated word for word what that lady had said. Now, the point, the point of all of that was, I said to her then, well, who do you think God was speaking to in this meeting? It was to you. So God can use it as a translation, but it is not. It's an interpretation. And God can sovereignly mix it all around like that in an amazing way. You know, Jesus spoke in parables and, uh, <clears throat> to certain situations, and he transposed terms from the natural into the spiritual, and giving an interpretation to their meaning and not necessarily a literal translation. And so an interpretation... Uh, can be added without an expression or any alteration to the basic message, but it's different the way it comes about. Actually, also remember, on the day of Pentecost, one of the signs to the unbeliever was that people who hadn't learned languages were speaking languages that these other people knew about. So they must have been speaking sense, right? Isn't that amazing how God works? And the tongues and interpretation of tongues work very closely together. Actually, another context of this interpretation is when Jesus met the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. It says there in verse 27, Jesus explained to the two of them on the road to Emmaus what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. So he was interpreting. Actually, can you imagine that, that conversation? Jesus, the Messiah, interpreting himself through the scriptures. But the word of God, that must have been a phenomenal conversation. So it's not a translation. The second thing here is <coughs> that we have to be careful that we don't compare the length of the message in tongues with the length of the interpretation. And that it can work both ways. There could be a long message and a short interpretation or the other way around. <coughs> I'm a, I never, like last night I was preaching and uh, I was being translated or interpreted, if you like, but it was literally translation because he was translating from English into Polish. And uh, I remember at one, at one point I said something quite short and he said an awful lot. So I stopped and I said, um, I hope you're saying what I'm saying. Now, you haven't decided that you don't like what I'm saying, so you're preaching a different message, you know. But he said, oh, what I needed to do, I couldn't translate word for word what you were saying because it has a different meaning in Polish. So I had to in interpret what you said and explain it to make sense. So I understood that. Did you know that there are some 6,760 known languages to men? Now this, this is, these are old statistics. There may be more now. I don't know. 2,296 of them which are still used today. Quite apart from that, did you know there are 4,000 different dialects in India alone? Yeah. 4,000. There are 4,000 people groups in India. Isn't that amazing? And the Holy Spirit can use any known language or what about those that we don't know about? All the hundreds of unknown languages. You know, when we get to heaven, it's going to be interesting what kind of language we're going to speak. I'm sure it's going to be English, not Polish. Right, Matt? <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be a heavenly language, isn't it? Whatever. Right? <laughs> and then again, some of, the some of the languages, like Chinese, is very complex. Yeah. And some of the languages are stunted and short and so on. So we don't necessarily need to compare one with the other. Actually, let me say this about tongues. You know, when you speak in tongues, the more you use it, the more your vocabulary will grow. That's true. In fact, not only will that happen, but God can give you a new language, a, different, a completely different language. So what I want to encourage you is keep it well oiled. The more you speak, the more God's going to give back to you in an amazing way. 
And it's not the gift of interpretation, it's the gift of the interpretation of tongues. We've emphasized all along the supernatural character of all of the gifts of the Spirit, and this is no exception. And by abbreviating the title to the gift of interpretation, actually, if we're not careful, belittles the supernatural content of what this is really all about. It's the supernatural, it's not the gift of an ability to explain things naturally. It's a supernatural interpretation. Phenomenal. Also, I'm just going to bring this out. Excuse me. There's not merely one interpreter per local church. Because in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27, it says, Someone must interpret. In the, end, in the authorized version, it says, let one interpret. That doesn't mean to say that there should be one interpreter in each local church. Actually, it means, let someone do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay? So when, let someone, let one interpret. It means that someone must interpret it. Otherwise, we are not edified and built up. I haven't time to go into all of this right now, but the context is to, to bring order in a, in a public meeting so that there aren't things that take place chaotically, the things to be done decently and in order. If there are messages in tongues that come out in a public meeting, let it be by two or three at the most. And wisdom says that um, if it's any more than that, we just hold back. <coughs> because I believe, you know, to any public gathering, there's a, there's a specific purpose that God wants to say and, uh, and direct at that one particular time. I'm going to pass on quickly. Well, the other thing is that we try to encourage the use of the message of tongues, not in a public meeting like this so much, although it can happen, and especially in larger meetings, it becomes more difficult. For me, the best place to use this is in the smaller groups and in the life groups. Not exclusively, it doesn't have to be. But it, it, it is in a larger meeting, it's a lot more easily dealt with because of very practical things like PA and, and can you be heard and, and all that kind of a thing. Um, so what about its manifestation? What is the real reason for the interpretation of tongues? The, the reason for tongues, like I said last week, is both private and public. The majority of time for tongues, it's all to do with private, not public, generally speaking. And obviously, <clears throat> there is the time when it's given to edify the whole church publicly. And, and without the message of tongues being given, there would be no need to give an interpretation publicly. But I also believe that it's given for the individual privately. It's really interesting to understand that you can pray in tongues and God can give you the interpretation. There have been times when I've been in prayer and Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and, and it talks about groanings that can't be uttered within us. And the Holy Spirit intercedes with us and your spirit is praying and you're speaking in tongues. And, and then I start to praise the Lord. Then I start to pray and very often I know that what I'm praying is what the Holy Spirit has been interceding with me. Not every time, but it can happen that way. It's really interesting the way that begins to develop. And of course, an interpretation can be enhanced by the speaker. It's like with anything, the more you use something, the better you get at it and the more, the more confident that you become. Yeah. Well, that ought to be the case anyway. <laughs> and we're in, we're in, we are instructed to pursue this gift, especially if we speak in tongues. I, um, I, I believe we need to be more God conscious than what we uh, yeah. are. I believe we need to take God into our lives and into our hearts and into our church in a way that is far more than what we're seeing and doing. Now, I know the cry of all of our hearts is to know Jesus better, right? To know him more intimately. And I, I would like to encourage each one of us that uh, we get to the place where we have dialogue with God so intimately that uh, we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. In a powerful way. I've been in meetings when a person has given a message in tongues. And then that person themselves has proceeded to interpret it. 
because nobody else has interpreted it. That person should have stepped out in faith and prophesied, actually. But there you go. Last night in this church in Cheltenham, we were having a time of worship, and then there was this one girl started to sing in tongues, and she sang this beautiful message. It was God anointed. And after she'd finished singing it, she started to pray. What she was actually doing was interpreting what she'd just been worshiping with. It was powerful. What I want to do is for us to take to heart the direction that Paul gave to Timothy to stir up the gift within us. 2 Timothy 1.6. And that Greek word there, anazapurine, means literally to give fire again by private times of prayer and worship with the Spirit. The more you pray, the more you stir yourself up, the more God's going to speak to you and will speak through you. Now, with all of these gifts of the Holy Spirit, the point of it is not to bring definitions so that we tie them all in a box. You ought to know by now that very often they work together. When one gift is working, another gift is working at the same time. Yeah. And our, our design here is not to come to the place where we create a hierarchy of the spiritual Christians, the okay Christians, and the unholy Christians. Yeah. We're all Christians, right? Yeah. There's, no, there's nobody any better than anybody else. Yeah. Now, we are all called to live holy lives, absolutely. And the more holy a life we live, the more we will live with authority in our lives. But the point I'm making with all nine of these gifts of the Holy Spirit is that God wants every single one of us to be naturally supernatural. And rather than try to understand, well, what gift is that? And what am I doing here? It's great when you can define it and understand it. But ultimately, let's just do the stuff. Let's just do it. Let's be natural. Let's do the gifts of healing. Let's prophesy. Let's pray for the sick. Let's, let's have words of knowledge. Let's pray in tongues and see interpretations come. Let's hear the mind of God. Let's be a charismatic church. The word gift in 1 Corinthians is the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, from which we get our, the word charismata or charismatic. We are a charismatic church. In other words, we are a church that makes ourselves available for the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us so that we have dialogue with God and we work in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said... Before he went to, uh, back to, to on high, he said, he said, tarry in Jerusalem, wait there until you be endued with power from on high. The whole point of living naturally supernatural lives is to live a powerful lifestyle. That's what God wants us to do. I, I believe that's what these gifts are for. And they're not, do you know what? Most of these gifts, they're not for Sunday morning here. They, they can be, and fantastic when that happens. It starts when we leave here. You know, when we go to our neighbors, when we go to work. I've been saying every week, make sure you activate this through the week. Be God conscious. Listen to what people are saying and doing. Because as you make yourself available to the Holy Spirit, God will use you. And you will see supernatural activity. Just do it. Be evangelists. We've got, we, I think all of us are called to do that stuff. How many of you are burning in your spirit right now, can't wait to get home to your emails to do what Rosie's told us to do? Just reminding you to do that today, okay? <laughs> but the point is, we should have the same fervor and vigor in being available to the Holy Spirit to see this world turned upside down. I want to finish by saying this. In the Great Commission, as Jesus ascended back into heaven, he said, all power, exousia, all power, all authority has been given to me. And then he says, now I give it to you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. The same power that was in Jesus has been given to us. And Jesus said this, look, I have to do this. I have to go back so that the comforter will come and you will do greater things than you've seen me do. That's 
pretty powerful a statement. You know, Jesus could only be in one place at a time. So he performed miracles. He did signs and wonders. But he had to go to send the comforter. Now Jesus is present in our lives by the Holy Spirit in every Christian. And we're all over the world. So we can do greater things. We can do more things because we are his vessels. We are his children. We are his ambassadors. So all power has been given to us. So let's utilize that and be naturally supernatural. It starts like I did the very first message in week one of this 10-week series. There's nine gifts, but we did 10 weeks with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It all kicks off with that. And the more we do that, let's have the band up. The more we do that, the more we'll make ourselves available to see the powerful working of God in our hearts and lives. Let's, um, let's be unashamedly charismatic, power-filled, God-filled, Holy Spirit-led to see men and women's lives changed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.